Crusader Kings 3 Fate of Iberia DLC update launched today. It's a paid update and dare I say it delivers probably the best value for money that we've seen in a very long time. Even in New Zealand dollars, most Crusader Kings 3 players should be able to afford this DLC, which was accompanied by a free update, but really the jewel lies within the struggle, a new conflict mechanic added in the Fates of Iberia DLC. However, it's important to note that the DLC as a whole really builds on one of the potentially most interesting, most religiously diverse, cultural, dynastic regions in political turmoil and adds a whole load new gameplay at a really good price point. My name is Jumbo Pixel, and in this video I'm going to answer the question, is Fate of Iberia worth it in Crusader Kings 3? I'll take you through the paid DLC as well as a little bit on the free update and share my thoughts and review on this wonderful DLC pack. Let's begin. The most logical place to start is therefore in the start, the 867 Struggle for Iberia, the new scenario uh, that is added of course and is the key focus of this DLC pack. As I mentioned in the introduction, Iberia is a rich region of history, of culture, of politics, of conflicting faiths and interests and this DLC captures that honestly in ways that I didn't think it even could for a few dollars. Here are the five different uh, leaders that will be introduced in the default scenario, although of course it's important to note you can just jump in and play as anybody that you like. I've milled around with maybe two or three of them so far, you'll see some footage of that in this video, and I think they're pretty neat. The main feature that's added though is this struggle mechanic, a long-term conflict across large regions encompassing many different faiths and cultures. In this case, of course, it's the Iberian struggle, looking at the Iberian peninsula in of itself. Uh, inside of struggles, not all characters have to be at war, at least not at war all of the time. The struggle can play out more as a grand conflict, again, not limited to a specific war or even a specific leader. This can play out throughout the ages. It's focused on a struggle region, a specific highlighted border within the map. Of course, in this case, we are looking at the fate of Iberia itself. And the struggle itself has different phases, and these phases are enacted in ways that Honestly, it could take me hours to cover every single detail. However, what I'll look to give you here is the quick and dirty, what you need to know. The struggle phases are impacted, as you can see, by all of the different catalysts. In this case, we're looking at catalysts toward hostility. As I potentially move towards the hostile effects, the each phase, whether it's a hostile phase or a conciliation phase, and I'll show you all of them in a bit more detail later, has different phase effects, uh, stretching across faith, across culture, and all of these other effects that you can see on screen. They are incredibly detailed, stretching from character relations all the way up to empire relations. You can see that the phases, uh, to begin with, we either stretch towards hostility or consolation. Do I want to make this worse, more hostile, or do we want to reconcile and move towards uh, interfaith marriages and peace between the cultures and faiths that are trying to occupy the peninsula? As we move through each phase, these early phases you can see need to reach 1000 progress using their catalysts in order to move the grand conflict through into its next stages. It does sort of tick up slowly over time, but grand directions will have greater effect. Whether you take war or more of the faith cultural game, I would advise using both because this is absolutely a grand mechanic, ultimately ended by ending the struggle. It's somewhat difficult to pull together. You can either go for dominance, pushing for military victory, the status quo, or Cold War historians among us might push for detente instead, sort of ending the conflict neutrally. And then we have struggle involvement, because of course, even though this is a grand conflict, there are many actors within it, your characters and many others, including their realm, their faith and their culture, will ultimately fight toward this struggle. Having a look in the back end, I think we get a lot more interesting detail. This is absolutely extra for experts, but I think it would be unjust to not include it here. Jumping onto the CK3 wiki, you can have a look at just how detailed the Fate of Iberia DLC is. Your involvement can be involved, you can be an interloper, or you can be completely uninvolved, depending on whether your realm capital is within the region, and whether your faith and then your culture as well are involved. 
The phases themselves are neat. You can see that the Iberian struggle goes through four phases that change every three months with those 1,000 catalyst points. We have the opportunity phase early on. That then bleeds through into this hostility. Look at these different things that are impacting the entire game as we also move through to conciliation here a different tact you can see massive bonuses or penalties to everything prestige piety peace <laughs> truces conflict bonuses and then ultimately leading through into the ending where we have massive benefits to renown or to faith and on your character as well because while this is a grand battle this is also one playing out by people, people's stories, uh, events, holy wars, or character traits. This DLC manages to bring it all into one. And while the struggle is absolutely real, there's more where that came from. You see this update, the paid version, the actual DLC itself, includes more. Uh, largely, we've witnessed a, quote, dazzling array of new thematic events, uh, decisions, and cultural traditions unique to Iberia. Some of these events I've played around with a few, they are hilarious, uh, historically accurate, and meticulously researched to a T, absolutely. Uh, furthermore, we'll receive more dresses for our characters, including a lot of the traditional ones associated with the region, uh, and Muslim princes do bear particularly well here, I believe. Also, a new host of 3D models and environments, uh, including but not limited to the game's units, uh, seafaring units as well, they look particularly cool, and holdings. We'll also receive a series of artifacts building on the Royal Court DLC. Uh, artifacts, heirlooms, and treasures for our court, for our kingdoms, and our regalia. And of course, a reminder that those will stretch from weapons uh, to treasures to things that you can put up in your throne room. Incredible. Uh, finally, of course, there's also a soundtrack, artwork, and all of the things that we would expect from a DLC experience. And one that's delivered for a little more than five bucks. I think we're fairly lucky. There's also, though, a free update to go alongside that I'll talk about before I move through into the is it worth it, because you can't really discuss whether the paid DLC is worth it until you reflect on what you've also got for free. Uh, firstly, the garments of the Holy Roman Empire, as you just saw on screen, have been given to us for free. We've also received a variety of bug fixes as well. Uh, and of note, I haven't found this update to be very buggy at all, so I think those have done very well. Moving along from the garments of the Roman Empire that loads of people requested for free, so we got them. Separate from this region, of course, you can see the change log for the 1.6 update here if you'd like to really get into the detail, but let me share some things for you. Uh, features of the flavor pack itself, one that people have talked about in the reviews, chessboard for two to four players, but loads of other things. Of course, here we're more focused on the free features though. And the free features are nowhere near as impactful as the paid ones, but you do still get some pretty neat things out of a, what is probably fairly described as a major update, the 1.6 version of Crusader Kings 3. Now, I want to clarify here that these changes that you can see are all pretty important. Uh, game balance, game content, and then a suite of changes for everything from the AI to how it defends to its motivation. It's significantly more inclined to be doing certain actions like warring or prioritizing family members. Very good. But overall, these uh, changes won't deliver the same experience that you'll get from the paid DLC. The paid DLC is really where it's at. It's got all of the flashings and fittings. And then the free update is brilliant, as you can see by the changes that have been added, but it really is best consumed alongside of the paid one. This isn't always the case in strategy games. It's not always the case that the DLC is or should or may even outclass the free update. Uh, but in this case, I think there are two things to note. Firstly, the free features are a wonderful suite of features they really do a good job to polish the experience, to balance the experience, and to add some neat new things. Like, for example, the new 867, that's the year 867 bookmark for Iberia. It's free to play for everyone. And it's a brilliant example because while it's free to play for everyone, you're really not going to get the best experience unless you have the DLC. And this DLC, I think, is a particularly good example of that. One of the best we've seen. So then, is the Iberian struggle worth the effort you're putting in to struggle? Is it worth its price point? Does it deliver the gameplay features that we want? I think the answer is actually a resounding yes. More so than most of the time. Let me tell you why. Is the Crusader Kings 3 struggle for Iberia worth it?
As I invite one of my counts on an activity, I think reflecting on Crusader Kings 3 Fate of Iberia DLC, is it worth it? The answer is a resounding yes. I believe that this DLC is a pretty innovative take, taking essentially a super event, right? The struggle. It stretches characters, it stretches years, it stretches faiths and cultures even individual conflicts don't necessarily matter in the grand scheme. It takes that idea of losing a battle but winning the war and pumps it full of steroids and sends it along its way. It opens up huge amount of potential, I think, as well for the community, for the modding aspect of this game, which is brilliant and something that I've barely scratched the surface on. But more importantly, I think that the struggle for Iberia really shows that Paradox can take a few risks implementing a system that has, in my opinion, turned out to be by far and away smooth, fun, and it adds extra content and complexity in a game that is, to be fair, already very complicated. Uh, in my opinion, without bogging it down too much. And that's one of the things that I really like. Like any Crusader Kings experience, you're probably going to have to put a little bit of time into it before you really get into the detail and really feel comfortable with it. At least that's true for me. I could use more time still, to be fair, a lot more. However, I think that the struggle mechanic really has paid off for Paradox here. I hope the Paradox uh, move through to realize just how impactful this could be. I think that this DLC, much like the Northern Lords flavor pack that came before it, is well worth its price point. I actually argue more so. Not only is it cheaper, but arguably it delivers more. The sheer amount of content in this DLC pack, from the new start, the characters, the events, the cosmetics, and of course the overall grand struggle mechanic perfectly suit. Crusader Kings to a T. I think the DLC is well polished, delivered at a fair price. I really can't fault it much. If you've got a spare five or six bucks, I can highly recommend you check out Crusader Kings 3, Fate of Iberia. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.